okay, hi, I'm very sorry. I wish that I were more technologically accomplished, um, but this is not going so well. Um, I'm going to try to make it through this first movement of the Telemann. I'm going to skip the repeats this time and hopefully get going uh, to the rest of the program. Let's give it a shot.
Okay, well, sorry, it looks like the end of the Telemann cut out. I'm not sure where or why. Um, I really wanted to play the next piece for you. I'm going to give it a shot. If it fails, um, I will redo it um, at another time when I can figure out the computer issue. Um, uh, Ernst Krennic was an Austrian child prodigy, and uh, he achieved superstar status uh, with uh, the opera that he wrote in 1926, Johnny Spielt Auf. Uh, it's about a jazz violinist, and he employs jazz motifs and displays interracial relationships. Um, that combined with the fact that he married Gustav Mahler's daughter, who was a Jew, um, really made the Nazi party hate him. Uh, they had a great distaste for him, um, even though the marriage only lasted a year. Um, his opera had a huge popular following. He became rather wealthy, um, but the opera was later condemned uh, by the Nazi party as the black shame and banned. Krennic said, knowing that my name was on the black lists of Germany and sensing that Hitler would soon overtake my homeland, I decided in 1937 to emigrate to the United States. Um, so he came to the United States in 1938, which is the year of the degenerate music uh, exhibit in Dusseldorf. Um, and uh, all of his works were eventually banned in Germany. Um, of course, he wasn't black or Jewish, but his works were banned because they were considered modern and atonal. Um, and that they focused on inappropriate subjects. Um, he initially settled in Minneapolis um, and then moved to California where he wrote this piece for solo oboe. And um, very little is known about this piece. Uh, it was written in 1956, but not premiered till 1960. Why, I cannot tell you. Um, I looked a lot into it and I really couldn't find, uh, find that information anywhere. Um, he did say uh, in 1939, after he started making a little bit of money uh, when he got a teaching post at Vassar, that I believe the task of enlightening the minds of American youth is not only the most exciting, but also very important because the future of music on the whole rest, uh, I'm sorry, because the future of music will on the whole rest upon the insight and enthusiasm of the coming generation of Americans. Um, so I program this piece not because I have to, I can put whatever I want on these programs. Um, but I programmed it because I actually really like it now. And when I first started learning it, to be honest, it wasn't my favorite, um, to use the words of my children. And um, it really grew on me, and, and maybe I shouldn't be saying that it wasn't my favorite, but it grew on me, um, and I want to tell you why, so maybe hopefully that means something to you. Um, so this atonality, um, this, is, this piece is not completely atonal. The movements, most of them center around the note D, and the middle one centers around the note F. I'm sorry, the third one. Uh, centers around the note F, but it um, we don't have the sort of typical harmonic structure that we're used to, that we absorb just being a human in the Western world. So um, Krennic, you know, sort of departed from that standard tonality, and that gives a lot of music a, a sense of chaos and lack of grounding. Um, so that kind of makes sense if you consider what was going on in his life. Um, but I think even within those constraints, he finds some really um, amazing expressive things here. Um, the third movement to me is like a demented Pop Goes the Weasel, and he has a lot of real melodic expression despite the fact that there's no tonal tonality. So anyway, um, Krennic never regained his, um, his status that he had achieved uh, in the 20s and 30s in Europe, um, and you know even after he's dead, he's barely known, but uh, I wanted to share this piece with you anyway, and if it doesn't work, if it cuts out in the middle, um, I will try to redo this concert once I know what's going on. Thanks.
Okay, I think it's still working. I hope, fingers crossed. Um, the next piece is by the composer Henri Tomasi. Uh, Tomasi was the son of working class parents from Corsica, and his father always made him play for upper class families, and he quite detested that, and uh, called it performing like a, training, a trained animal in, uh, in his letters. Uh, he had hopes to become a sailor, but ended up instead with a double career as a very well-regarded conductor and composer. He conducted all the big places in Europe, and um, he, he wrote that actually composition was far more important to him and that conducting got in his way. Uh, he was apparently a workaholic and very inspired by exotic sounds and colors from around the world. Maybe that's because he wanted to be a sailor. Um, he was also quite inspired by medie medieval religious songs. Uh, in a letter from 1970, um, a few years after this piece was written, he said, I'm ashamed to eat my fill, and when I see and read about what happens in this vile world, it's impossible for me not to be revolted. Uh, this piece was written for the oboist Etienne Baudot, um, and he evokes uh, women from four different continents in the world. He tells the oboist to sound like a faraway drum, as well as a xylophone. Uh, and then the drum is in the first movement, the xylophone is in the third movement and a Gregorian chant makes an appearance in the second movement. So it's really kind of a nice trip to a bunch of different places from your living room uh, and through different times, all in one little oboe piece. This is a very new piece for me. I just started looking at it six days ago. So this is, um, you know, uh, where I am at this point in time, and I hope the internet or computer work.
On earlier concerts, lockdown oboe solo concerts that actually continued um, without stopping, um, I've played various groupings of Alyssa Morris's collision etudes. Uh, I've been learning them in quarantine, and the piece is sort of too big and monumental. It was too big and monumental to just play in one week, learning in one week. But I felt before these concerts came to an end that I really wanted to put all six of them together in the way that she intended for them to be performed. Um, so Alyssa says that she was inspired by uh, Gilles Silvestrini's six etudes, which were um, based on French Impressionist paintings. And so she chose to write these pieces based upon um, uh, American women painters. And so I wanted to give her the opportunity now to describe these collisions, why each of the six pieces she writes here is a collision. And um, here she is. I thought it would be fun to, in each movement, sort of try to at least collide two different musical ideas together, two different underlying themes that are sort of the compositional game for each movement. In the first movement, which is summertime, uh, it's based on the jazz uh, chord changes for the jazz tune, Summertime. Those chord changes are sort of underlying, and there's a new contrafact written above so there's that element colliding with inspired by silvestrini also full tone and and french impressionist sound because mary cassatt's painting inspired by that french impressionist style so i tried to collide the sort of french sound with the jazz um, chord changes and then the second movement city landscape by joan mitchell it is a collision of the idea of chromesthesia or synesthesia, where when you hear different sounds, you're seeing different colors in your mind. This kind of phenomenon happens for some people sometimes when they're listening to music and, and they hear a different key or a different note, and, and it sort of produces a different color red. Some people, this is sort of a, some, a regular occurrence for them. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and Scriabin created this um, piano sort of looking thing where he sort of mapped out what his version of this was. So I was gonna use this keyboard that Scriabin created to give me the idea of when I kind of looked at the painting from right to left and put it over a, a time map that when I was at this point in time in the piece, I was gonna be in this, um, using these sort of pitch sets that associated themselves with those colors. So there's the synesthesia element colliding with the sort of sounds of the city, hip hop infused in a way with some of the articulations and some of the figures, sort of a constant hum and movement that, that you would hear in a city too. There's always like kind of this, this hum in the background and always things happening. Based on a painting by Georgia O'Keeffe called Jimson Weed. And it's a very close up look at Jimson Weed and the, and the flowers are sort of turning, but then there's a more introspective, winding, minor feel in the middle. So we're colliding these two elements of this fast sort of showpiece with this more winding and introspective middle section. So, and then in the fourth movement, this is Rainbow by Alma Thomas. The painting is, in my mind, what a rainbow would look like if you were right in it. But if you could be in the middle of a rainbow and see what it looks like, it would probably look like, like these little fractals of, of cloud dust and different colors really close up, but also kind of um, hazy and muted. And, and so the painting is just these 
color blocks. I decided to collide the chromesthesia or synesthesia idea again, and then these harmonic fingerings. So it's those two underlying ideas that I'm sort of colliding to create that particular etude. In the fifth movement, this kind of shares similar ideas from the first movement since Autumn Leaves is also the title of a jazz standard and Autumn Leaves is the title of the fifth movement, um, a painting by Georgia O'Keeffe also. I decided to use the chord changes again to be the underlying melodic guiding factor and decided to transcribe the Miles Davis, which is actually in the same tune. He and Cannonball Adderley record that track together on something else. And so I recorded his solo and then on another album, a Chet Baker solo, and then on another album, the John Coltrane solo, all over Autumn Leaves changes. I decided to just take little motives or licks from each one of their solos and sort of intersperse them as if, as if they were having a musical conversation. The collision in this case is the underlying chord changes of Autumn Leaves interspersed with jazz conversation that's happening between these four artists. Number six is based on a painting by Margaret Bagshaw. Margaret Bagshaw is a Native American painter and painted My World is Not Flat. Her mother and grandmother were painters also. Her grandmother, Pablita Velarde, was a flat painter is what it was called. The style was called flat painting. And so I think that Margaret Bagshaw is paying tribute to that. She's recognizing her grandma by calling this painting My World is Not Flat because she recognizes that this is all, that painting is all part of her heritage and is kind of nodding to that. Her painting style, in my mind, it's very Picasso inspired, a cubist inspired, I guess. And and also you see a lot of turning and winding. It looks like gears in a way too, and really vibrant colors. And so I thought that sort of winding and gears and angularity, um, to me, it made me think of, well, this is a little bit outside of the box and, and not flat. And what can I do on the oboe to depict the not flat world of the oboe? And maybe it's all of the different kinds of sounds that we make on, we can make on the oboe that we don't always get to. Okay. I lost sound in there. I hope the movie played because the sound is separate for that, but uh, fingers crossed again, this is living on the edge. Thank you. 
So thank you so much for staying if you made it through all of that insanity. I don't know what the nature of those problems were, but my audio kept cutting out all the time. So I hope some of it got across. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for staying with me. Uh, it's my privilege to play for you tonight in your homes. I hope you're doing well. I will be back next week with the Telemann 11th Fantasy in G Major, and uh, probably will announce the rest of the repertoire tomorrow. Hopefully I will figure out my technological difficulties, and um, hope you all have a great weekend and good night. <laughs>